Scared to death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You're Lindsay. I want to sit like this for this show, because this shirt is so big. (laughs) Okay. So you can pull it off for the whole show. It's I I like your shirt. It's very fun. Very fun bird shirt. Bird shirt. (laughs) <laughs> it's pretty silly. <laughs> a couple announcements, and they were off and running. Uh, quick merch announcement and charity announcement. Uh, this week's merch drop, unlike anything we've done before, amazing new VHS lamps are in the store now. We have one right here on the set. Yeah, very cool. You can see like, so the red cool. light glowing out of it. Scared to death VHS set or VHS tape. Uh, each handmade lamp features a real VHS tape that looks as if it was buried in the backyard. Got some moss and stuff on it. Looks like maybe it's evidence of something, some kind of found footage, start of a new horror movie. Uh, Dug it up from somewhere. Yeah, like handmade and very cool, very unique. Uh, Limited quantity of these. Uh, Definitely a specialty item. So head on over quick to badmagicmerch.com if you're interested. Also, just for fun and to keep uh, adding to the merch catalog, we have an awesome demon goat tee and poster dropping as well. So, so much to check out uh, as always. Um, One more thing actually before you uh, take over the the charity announcement. Recording this in advance of our live show, but it'll drop after the live show is over. Just hoping we had a great time and that, uh, you know, everybody who bought a ticket did as well. And thanks to everyone who bought a ticket. I'm hopeful that our costumes turn out as well in person as they have been built up in my brain. Okay. So hopefully everyone's like, oh, those were good. Okay, cool. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Are we ready for a little charity announcement? Yeah. Well, it is November, and as is tradition here at Bad Magic, every November we donate to a veteran cause in honor of Veterans Day on November 11th. And this year, our donation is going to the United Heroes League, who provides free sports equipment, game tickets, cash grants, and skill development camps and special experiences to military families across the U.S., The United Heroes League keeps military kids active and healthy through sports while their parents serve our country. Of course, we're recording in advance, so the amount is to be determined at this moment. But if you'd like to learn more, it's a really unique... cool charity. Yeah, uh, you know, serving the kids of military, Mm -hmm. uh, veterans, active duty, dishonor... uh, on honorably discharged <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those of you who are naughty no just kidding uh but yeah it's a really cool i ran into a fan mike uh at target a couple weeks ago uh-huh. and i was ch- i was chatting with him and his daughter and he told me about this so oh, cool. thank you mike i i love this this is a really unique operation yeah it is that's awesome we love to support good people doing good things. Absolutely. Uh, what do you have for us this week, horror friend? I have two awesome tales. I have uh, The Smoking Man at the Funeral Home, mm. which is a very fun, cool, wild, and interesting tale about working in a funeral home. Mm-hmm. And then I have, oh man, this story creeped me out, The Lady in the Chair. It is, to me, I feel like it is every kid's nightmare for this to happen. All right. So this sounds especially spooky. Yeah, I really I know I know that this episode drops on uh, November 1st, but like you guys are still going to be in spoopy mode and I wanted to make sure to be extra spoopy. <laughs> Perfect. Um, m- my stories are both of them are set in America, uh, both historically significant as far as their settings. I'll first be talking about Massachusetts Longfellow's Wayside Inn and the ghost of a former employee perhaps a succubus Uh, that's been haunting the place for over a century and a half. And then we'll head south a bit to Maryland and look into various claims of spirits that may haunt historic Fort McHenry, site of a battle that inspired the writing of America's Star Star Spangled Banner. So a bit of history mixed into haunted lore this week. Oh man, that sounds like your all-time favorite. Yeah, I I do like the history and horror combination. You love history. I do. We were just on the East Coast and I just want to say, as soon as you said Massachusetts, I was like, take me back to Massachusetts, take me back to Vermont. It was so yeah. beautiful this past weekend when we went. Well, it's funny, the setting to this first story is actually, we drove within probably two miles of this inn. Oh, really? Longfellows? Mm-hmm. I'll explain uh, 
in the beginning of the setup. Ooh, I'm excited. It's kind of like, you know, where we were. Uh, are you ready to begin? Yes. This week, I'm wearing very tight jeans. Mm-hmm. And also, I'm wearing socks that I brought from home because mm-hmm. they're like these blue tie-dye socks. And I love them. And they're so, they're fuzzy on the inside. Nice. And they match my shirt. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> and and just one real quick thing, too. I have yeah. our limited edition Halloween blanket from our live show. Mm. So, uh, in, in case you're still looking to get it, you better get it quick because it's going to go out of the store here real soon. It's, it's awesome. It's got the witch on it. Oh, yeah. I don't I'll have had it on the live show. I know that. But in case you missed it. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Longfellow's Wayside Inn first opened its doors in Sudbury, Massachusetts back in 1716. And it's never shut them. It is the oldest continuously operating inn in the entire U.S. Ah, <laughs> cool. Yeah, only briefly uh, ever deviating from its posted operating hours due to the occasional uh, renovation and a fire. But it's never just sat ready for business but empty. Famous visitors have included former President Calvin Coolidge, Aviator Charles Lindbergh, inventor Thomas Edison, General Marquis de Lafayette, a French aristocrat and revolutionary war leader, and the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, whose name was added to the inn's name after he published a book of poetry he wrote after being inspired by a brief stay at the inn. And the famed automotive industrialist Henry Ford not only visited the inn, but owned it for a time after falling in love with the place. The original owners were the Howe family. The Howe started off as a family residence in 1707. For John Howe, town marshal, and grandson of a man of the same name who was the first English inhabitant of neighboring Marlborough, Massachusetts. And we drove right through this area when we were heading from Worcester to Boston on Highway 9. That little gas station we stopped at just off that little road where you and the kids use the bathroom. <laughs> just a few miles from this inn. Is, is that where we changed our clothes? Mm, I don't remember you guys changing your clothes. You might have. I might, I might not have paid attention to that detail. Okay, okay. Uh, the Howe family was living in the area by 1656. The property in Sudbury was turned into an inn after John's nephew David got a permit to keep hours of entertainment at his establishment in 1716. David Howe transformed the house into a four-room inn for he and his wife, Hepzibah Death, and their children. Wait, her name was Hepzibah Death? Her her last name was literally Death, D-E-A-T-H, daughter of John Death. Dr. Death? Mr. Death. I don't know if he's a doctor. Yeah, Mr. Death. I want him to be. Uh, I thought that was a typo. Did some Ancestry.com family tree digging to make sure that was legit. Yeah, her name, Hepzibah Death. H-E-P-Z-I-B-A-H. Unique name to say the least. Sounds like a name somebody made up for a horror movie. Uh, David and Hepzibah would have seven children and the Howe family would own the inn, originally called Howe's Tavern, for the next 150 years. Howe's Tavern primarily served travelers using the Boston Post Road to travel from Boston to New York. The Inwood, due to its location between these two cities, also served as a meeting point for some American militia members in 1775 prior to the opening Revolutionary War Battle of Lexington and Concord. Four generations of the Howe family owned and ran the inn. The final Howe family innkeepers were a brother and sister named Lyman and Jerusha Howe. Lyman Howe, who was nicknamed the Squire, was the last official Howe innkeeper. Jerusha helped her brother run the place, and she was known for her beauty and was nicknamed the Belle of Sudbury. Jerusha owned the only piano in the entire town and frequently performed for her guests. Harper's New Monthly Magazine once wrote about her. She possessed great common sense combined with refined tastes, musical accomplishments, and rare domestic abilities. She was delicate in person, not of robust constitution, which kept her at home under the care of watchful parents. Many men in town wanted Jerusha to be their wife, but she was very particular and only wanted to marry an Englishman. One day, a handsome Englishman bachelor did visit the inn. He and Jerusha fell in love, quickly decided to get married. He planned to travel home to settle his affairs and then marry Jerusha when he soon returned. But then Jerusha never heard from or saw her fiance again. There are two theories about what happened. One, that he either became uh, lost at sea and died, or that he just used Jerusha for some pre-marital romance and never actually intended to marry her. What a naughty pants. That was a big deal back then. Jerusha, terribly embarrassed by the entire affair, never had another romantic relationship in her life. She lived with her brother at the inn for the rest of her days, dying alone in in 1842 at the young age of 45. And some say she died of a broken heart. Her brother Lyman died two decades later in 1861, also dying alone. He never married or had children, and his death ended the Howe legacy at the inn. The new owners quickly changed the inn's name to the Red Horse Tavern. The inn then rose to national prominence soon afterwards due to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow using it as the setting for his popular poetry book, Tales of a Wayside Inn. 
Longfellow visited the inn in 1862 after his publisher encouraged him to take a vacation. Longfellow's second wife, Fanny Appleton Longfellow, had tragically died in a fire, and Longfellow experienced writer's block while he grieved her passing. On July 9, 1861, Fanny had been sealing envelopes with wax when she accidentally caught her dress on fire. Longfellow was there, attempted to put the fire out with the rug and with his body, but Fanny was burned so <gasps> badly, she just, cut, which just burst up into flames, died from her injuries the next day, and Longfellow was severely injured as well. What an incredibly terrible thing to witness, your partner literally burning to death in front of you. Longfellow's publisher thought a trip to the inn would help him get back to writing. The Red Horse Tavern was in poor condition when he arrived. He described it as a rambling, tumble-down building. But something about the place spoke to him. Longfellow only visited the Red Horse Tavern for one day in October of 1862, didn't even stay overnight, and never came back. He was, however, deeply inspired by his short visit and in 1863 published Tales of a Wayside Inn. The prelude of the book reads, One autumn night in Sudbury Town, across the meadows, bare and brown. The windows of the Wayside Inn gleam red with firelight through the leaves of woodbine hanging from the eaves, their crimson curtains rent and thin. Round this old-fashioned quaint abode, deep silence reigned, save when a gust went rushing down the country road and skeletons of leaves and dust. A moment quickened by its breath, shuddered and danced their dance of death, and through... And through the ancient oaks overhead, mysterious voices moaned and fled. Sounds like he might have been talking about ghosts. <sighs> Maybe he didn't stay the night because he was spooked. The Red Horse Tavern saw a huge surge in tourism thanks to this book. Eventually changed its name to Longfellow's Wayside Inn to keep business going. And then Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, an admirer of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, purchased and restored the property in 1923 after also visiting just once. He wanted to turn the land around it into a living history museum. Ford constructed a grist mill and a chapel. He had a schoolhouse moved to the location from nearby Sterling. Allegedly, Mary from the poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb, had attended that schoolhouse. Ford installed a cider press, blacksmith, and canning kitchen, and the grist mill he erected is still used to make flour today. The inn almost burned down in 1958. By that time, the Ford family no longer owned the property, but the Ford Motor Company still paid to restore the inn. The Wayside Inn is still operational today, a historic preservation uh Mind, or his, a historic, my God, preservation-minded nonprofit <laughs> has ran it since Ford relinquished ownership in the 1940s. And visitors can book a stay in one of the historic rooms, eat at the inn's restaurant, and walk around the large property. And the inn, with its long history, not surprisingly reportedly haunted and attracts a fair number of ghost hunters. So let's look into what spirit draws them to this place. Time now for the tales of the Wayside Inn's ghost. The inn has long been reportedly haunted by the spirit of Jerusha Howe, her spirit known as the Wayside Inn Ghost. Rumors of her haunting go at least as far back as 1868. Allegedly, the hostess of the inn at that time wrote a note about someone reportedly witnessing a floating ghost in one of the rooms, a room now called the Hobgoblin Room, a ghost that looked remarkably like Jerusha. Today, guests often report hearing eerie piano notes playing in the middle of the night, and several guests have claimed to see the spirit of Jerusha Howe. Rooms 9 and 10 are the primary paranormal hotspots for these encounters. Room 9 was Jerusha's room when she was alive, and room 10 was used as her sewing room. Jerusha seems particularly drawn to male guests, and in some cases is made out to be a succubus. Men have reported feeling someone breathing softly on their face, breathing seductively perhaps. Some of them have claimed to open their eyes and actually witness Jerusha's face floating above their own for a moment before disappearing. Others have said they felt her caressing them, while they lay in bed, caressing them as a lover would. Still others report feeling her laid down with them when they climb into bed. Guests in room 9 and room 10 have allegedly smelled Jerusha's perfume in their rooms, often described as a citrus scent. Jerusha's bedroom has two entrances. One is the main door from the sitting room, and the second leads to a narrow staircase that goes to the dining area. Various guests and ghost hunters have reported paranormal encounters with their spirit on that staircase. Some say they've seen her spirit, others have claimed to feel it brush past them. Several guests have claimed much more intimate encounters, such as feeling Jerusha's hands touching or grabbing their most intimate areas as they lay in bed. A few guests said they've also awakened to see Jerusha standing at the foot of their bed, watching them for at least 30 minutes in one case. Other guests have heard a woman crying, witness faucets turn on and off by themselves, watch curtains sway when there was no wind, seen windows open by themselves, or heard strange noises in the hallways late at night. There have been so many encounter claims, the Wayside Inn guests have established a secret drawer society where they write notes about their stay and any ghost encounters they might have had. 
They hide those notes in drawers in their rooms or in other more secretive places. Francis Copels, the innkeeper in the 1950s, started the Secret Drawer Society when he hid candy throughout the inn for young mm-hmm. guests. Some adults staying there wanted to participate in something similar and started writing these ghost notes and hiding them, and that continues to this day. It's been going on for decades now, with many a guest enjoying the surprise of finding one of these notes in their rooms and then either writing their own note or spending a largely sleepless night terrified by what they read. In their Season 5 Valentine's Day special, the Ghost Adventures team traveled to the Wayside Inn, and while this investigation was a lot more lighthearted than normal, they did do some interesting interviews, caught a few strange EVPs, including a voice saying it would tickle Zach Bagans if he laid down on the bed, (laughs) and Zach's here when asked if she knew his name. Dan Grillo, a guest, told Ghost Adventures about a strange encounter he had in Jerusha's bedroom, saying it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and an arm went around me. I could feel it go across my back, and then I realized, wait a minute, who is this? I jumped up and looked at the other side of the bed, and there was a clear impression. He called the experience fun, saying it was not sexual, but rather comforting. Front desk worker Sue Wepley, or Welpley, shared another ghostly bedtime experience at the inn, saying, a man came down and said, I gotta tell you something. I was looking at him going, yeah. He goes, I'm asleep. And then all of a sudden, something ripped the sheets right off of me. And I yelled at my wife, and she was like, I didn't do that. Sue thinks that Jerusha might be jealous of men who bring their wives into her room which is why she interacts almost exclusively with male guests and seems to act angrier when female guests are present. Lee Swanson, former curator, has also confirmed that guests have had intimate encounters with Jerusha. During the Ghost Adventures investigation, Zach claimed to feel something touching his leg. When he asked Jerusha to touch him, he felt two taps on his leg. Team member Aaron Godwin, uh, Goodwin said he felt a sensation going up both his legs when he was speaking to Jerusha's spirit. In 2019, Jeanette Hinkle from the Metro West Daily News spoke with the Wayside Innkeeper Steve Pickford and paranormal investigator Laura Ano about all these claims of ghosts. Steve is the 11th innkeeper to have worked in over the past three centuries. And Laura told Hinkle that she's read roughly 250 notes uh, that guests have written claiming a variety of paranormal experiences. Many of them speak of Jerusha climbing into their beds. One man even reported receiving a back rub from Jerusha while his wife was away in the bathroom. A few wrote of extremely sexual encounters. Laura's friend was investigating the hotel at 3 a.m. and said he saw a black misty thing rise from the floor over to the side of the bed and then fly over the bed and into the wall. It happened a second time a few minutes later. Laura and her friends came to investigate, tried to replicate the shadow in any way they could think of to see if it was just a coincidence, and they couldn't do it. Jerusha, perhaps? Another paranormal investigator, Laura, uh, Laura Knows, told her that he recorded ghostly piano music one night. Laura said he was sound asleep, his tape recorder was playing, and he woke up to the sound of a piano. It was faint, but not so faint that it didn't wake him up. He couldn't name the tomb, so to speak, but he jumped up and started, you know, uh, to exit the door, started going down the stairs, and the noise got fainter. He ran back up the stairs again, and as he started to approach the room, he started. He couldn't hear it again until he got close to the room. It was at his loudest when he was in the room. He was excited because he knew he was catching it on tape, and he took the tape and ran it through their so- a software program. He could see the sound. He could hear the sound. He identified the notes. And then through researching the five songs that she was most known for playing, found out it was the Battle of the Prague. We found a YouTube recording of that, she said, and he was able to match it to the notes that were being played. The Battle of Prague was one of Jerusha's favorite songs. It seems likely that the Wayside Inn might just truly be haunted by the lonely spirit of Jerusha Howe, a woman who died there 180 years ago. And her unrequited romance, maybe that left her with some kind of powerful sexual energy. I'll end the story with the most sexual note we found by a guest who claimed to have a very intimate experience with her. An anonymous guest wrote, This happened tonight. A particularly cold December night. My one and only night, I'll be staying here at the inn. I'm driving up to Maine tomorrow and I wanted to start the drive early and was in bed tonight by 9.30 after dinner and a few drinks downstairs. I'd overheard a table of other guests sharing stories of supposed encounters with the spirit of Jerusha and at first when I began to feel things... I was convinced I was making it all up, that their stories had really gotten my mind moving in that direction, or that I'd fallen asleep somehow and was dreaming, but then eventually I realized that I was wide awake and what was happening to me was very real. It started just a few hours ago, right after I turned off the light on the nightstand. When I laid my head back down on my pillow and tugged on the sheet and comforter to wrap it around me a bit more snugly, the room was pretty chilly, I felt resistance. Initially, I assumed the sheet was tucked under the mattress on the other side of the bed, but then I realized if that was true, wouldn't I have felt it earlier when I first crawled into bed? 
and it didn't really feel like the sheet was under the mattress. It felt like it does when the sheet is wrapped around another body. I've shared my bed with enough partners in the past to know the difference. And now I felt a weight beside me, the weight of a body, and the warmth. My mind flashed on Jerusha. I was a bit unsettled, but not really afraid at this point. The stories the other guests shared never mentioned the spirit harming anyone. And I thought, maybe I'm dreaming? Initially on my side, facing away from the other side of the bed, I rolled over now onto my back. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadowy form laying in bed next to me. Now I was a bit scared. I'd never been worried about an encounter with the ghost, but I'd also never imagined the possibility of one being so intimate. I never thought I could feel one. Plus, I felt so vulnerable. I sleep naked. And now here I am, no clothes on, by myself in this room with something laying next to me. And that something now reached out and touched me. A hand on my chest, gently caressing me with what felt like fingers. Warm fingers, not cold like I'd heard about in other ghost encounters. And it felt good. A lover's flirtatious touch. Another hand now caressed the side of my face as I felt and saw out of the corner of my eye the figure draw close. And it, she, whispered into my ear, close your eyes. I did. And then heart pounding, the spirit climbed on top of me. A woman's body, a naked woman's body was pressing down on mine. And I was aroused. And then even though it felt so wrong in a way, I didn't resist. And I felt a hand now grab me and guide me inside of it, inside of her. And she pushed her hips down onto mine. And I couldn't keep my eyes closed any longer. I opened them now and I saw this thing, not quite human looking, part beautiful woman, part something else, something dark and twisted, riding me, and I wanted out, and I screamed, no! This thing seemed to scream back, as she now locked eyes with mine, what passed for her eyes anyway, it's so hard to explain, she was like a person, built partly out of flesh, partly out of some sort of dark mist, and now that mist quickly dissipated, and I was alone, very awake, laying in my bed. I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights, and then I felt not just scared, but gross maybe? I took a hot shower, tried to scrub the encounter, not just from my mind, but from my body, and I couldn't fall back asleep, so I decided to write this note. I hope it's not too graphic, but it's what I believe happened to me. Is this spirit really the ghost of Jerusha or something else? I don't want to think about it too much right now, not while I'm still in this room and not while it's still dark out. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to me? Yeah, you sleep naked. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get a spirit, a succubus? You, you might. Honestly, I felt like, yeah, this would happen to Dan. Of all the people it would happen to, it would happen to you. Hello. How dare you? I don't think, is it cheating if it's a a demon or something or a ghost? Well, I feel like that's a a whole other thing. I I was actually thinking about it. I'm like, okay, in that situation, I don't think that you have any choice but to go with it. Because if if he... That's what you're saying. If I see a naked succubus spirit, Uh I have to fuck it. Yeah. Okay. Because because what's your alternate? Gonna, gonna make a note. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. seriously, what's the, what's the alternate choice? He would have just like, well, potentially just would have made her really angry. And while there's the no choices to roll out of your bed and run, <sighs> but he's naked, so he's got to get out of bed, <laughs> put some clothes on, yeah, or grab a blanket or a towel oh or something, God. right? And if you're in a hotel room, generally speaking, I mean, I don't know about all y'all, but like when we sleep in a hotel mm-hmm. room. We lock the, oh, we, yeah. we put the chain mm-hmm. and, the you know, locks. and the lock, usually like you can turn it one additional turn, like to the left and it puts the deadbolt mm-hmm, out. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you can even raise the handle. Sometimes yep. you have three locks. Mm-hmm. So now you are trapped naked in a <laughs> hotel room trying to get away from something. I don't even think that the, that if it's, uh, what's her name? Jerusha. Jerusha. I don't necessarily know that she's intending to cause harm, but she clearly wants what she wants. <laughs> So, what happens if she is denied? Is it a ghost or a demony thing? I don't think it's demony. I mean, yeah, usually when you hear sexual stuff, people like slant demon, but maybe not. Maybe that doesn't have to be that. Maybe a succubus doesn't always have to be uh, demonic. I, it just almost. I mean, going back to what uh, we we learned about her, about you know her Englishmen, mm-hmm. she truly might just be a woman scorned. Hmm. Hmm. I know. So sad that she like for the like very desired. And then, like, so embarrassed, she just, like, nope, like, refused to to entertain any suitors for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. I also wonder how many suitors she actually had after that, after word got out that maybe she was a loose woman, Mm. as they would say. I know. Back then, it was so insane. What a a weird term, loose. Loose woman. (laughs) I'm like, get out of here. But also interesting that her brother never married either. Mm -hmm. Like, we have friends. I was thinking about somebody that we know. Uh... 
where like their parents have a very successful marriage, but she's not married. Her brother's not married. Mm -hmm. so that's such a phenomena to me of like, if you have parents, you exemplify yeah. a long well, lasting relationship and then you don't. I think about that back then though, too. Like he could have, you know, easily been gay and living in oh, a time and place where think there was no outlet for that. Cause statistically there was the same amount of people gay back then that there is now. Really? Oh, I mean, I mean, that's what science thinks. That's what I firmly believe. Yeah. That it's just like a, a, a you know, percentage of the population. Yeah. That whole, um, what I think is nonsense when people think you can like turn gay. Ugh. It's like, I don't believe that. No part of me believes that. No and part, no, and no part that. of any study, you know, has indicated that. Legitimate right. study. Uh, so I think, you know, I just feel bad for people like living in these times. Yeah, it didn't even where, occur like, to me. A lot of these bachelors, I think it's like, well, yeah, because they weren't interested in women on any level, like because mm -hmm. It physically disgusted them mm -hmm. to think of a vagina, you know? So yeah. it's like, they would just be alone. Yeah. Oh, man. Or maybe, you know, or maybe he was straight and there just wasn't anybody. Also, limited uh, options back then. Right, right. And the the whole thing was carrying on the family name. Like, there was mm -hmm. so much pressure. Yeah. So it's like, you were really only, in my opinion, more often than not, you were truly just getting married for the advancement of your family. You weren't really marrying for love. Yeah, a lot sometimes, of times, yeah sometimes, a lot of times it was practical. Like uh, in these areas, it was, uh, you know, you needed somebody to pump out a bunch of kids with and you mm -hmm. needed to have those kids work your farm yep. or work your inn. Like people would birth their own labor force back then. Yeah. Like it, was, it was pretty common. And, and to carry on the business, yeah. Meanwhile, we're over here with two kids that don't want shit to do with our business. <laughs> They don't do jack shit around the house. So Yo, we don't have a labor whoa. force or anyone to take over <laughs> our business. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We have great kids. <laughs> um, yeah, that's just an interesting story. I mean, who knows that encounter claim was a little uh, much, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Well, I wasn't I, there. I like it. It's different than, I mean, we've, We've only really touched on succubuses a few times. One mm -hmm. a long time ago. I can't even remember the circumstances. And then one within the last couple of months, uh, the succubus in the mirror. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was especially Oof, yeah, that, was, that was a really creepy one. Do you have photos? Oh, yeah, I do have some photos. Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have uh, several photos. This first one is the Wayside Inn in modern times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so, again, mm -hmm. it just looks like a lot of the places we drove past, right, just uh, <sighs> a couple days ago. I love New England so much. This next one is a sketch of the inn from 1891. Cool. I mean, it's, I mean, it's looked the same pretty much the entire time. Sudbury. Uh, this next one, one of the rooms where Jerusha's spirit has allegedly shown up in bed. This is either her bedroom or sewing room. Wasn't quite made clear. I don't want to stay there. It doesn't even look comfortable. I don't know. It might be a nice bed. I don't think so. Low ceiling. Uh, it looks dipped. It's time to replace that mattress, guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is another room where uh, Jerusha has allegedly visited. Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of similar to the last one. And then oh, it looks like maybe it's just that photo, but like in the back corner, mm -hmm. uh, the bed is here and there's like a doorway, but yep. there's like a little... Uh, red area, mm -hmm. if you will, orange. But the wood stained the light. a little differently. But I'm like, well, it looks like a doorway. I don't know. It makes me uncomfortable where I'm just like, mm -mm, I don't want to be in that room. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a door. I think Because it said that one time she had like two doors to her room. Yeah. Maybe that's the one to the, to get the to The staircase food. or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then this is uh, this last one just to pick at the end at night. I always like to include one of those if they're out there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When you would see those things, hear those things. I mean, after our trip... Back east, I definitely mm -hmm. was like, oh, I want to live in Vermont. But then I think, mm -hmm. whew, well, we would have to live in a brand new house. <laughs> and I'd need to talk to the earth and make sure that it's a safe place. Because of all the places to buy a home, the the number of potentially haunted homes, the it must vastly, I'm sorry, my words are struggling today. There's older homes over there. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the likelihood yeah. of moving into and buying a haunted house is increases greatly. Yeah. Hot words are hard today. You guys yeah. have days like that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, bro. <laughs> you ready to move on to Maryland for more history and another haunting? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> I just thought you're still over there giggling. Decent amount of historical setup once again with this one. I'm trying. That's okay. You're doing good. Uh, when you think of Baltimore, Maryland's Fort McHenry, if you think of it at all, uh, you probably think of the Star Spangled Banner and the War of 1812. And uh, not unusual to see reenactors, you know, of the War of 1812 at this fort. On September 14th, 1814, the Battle of Fort McHenry inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, but in the years since, a series of reported encounters has led to many associating the fort with sightings of spirits and not with this song. Today, Fort McHenry is a well-preserved historic monument that commemorates the place where a thousand dedicated American soldiers defended the harbor during the Battle of Baltimore 
from September 13th to September 14th, 1814. Construction of Fort McHenry took place following the American Revolution between 1798 and 1800. Built on the site of the previous Fort Whetstone, Fort McHenry's purpose was to improve the defenses of the Port of Baltimore from future attacks. And the attack that would take place there, the Battle of Baltimore, would be a big turning point in the War of 1812. Following their devastating victory at Bladensburg, the British, the British forces had then burned the American capital in Washington, D.C. Riding on the shoulders of these successes, British commanders now had their eyes set on the third largest city in the U.S. at that time, the port city of Baltimore. But they wouldn't be able to take it. Facing off against the most formidable military in the world, American soldiers were able to hold their ground and save Baltimore, and perhaps also the entire nation. American soldiers stalled British land forces north and east of the city through defensive fortifications dug by citizens and 15,000 American troops. But there was still the formidable British Navy to deal with. If the Navy was allowed to sail into Baltimore Harbor, British land forces could then be reinforced by naval guns bombarding American defenses or even the city itself. Standing between the British Navy and the city of Baltimore was only the defenses of Fort McHenry and its roughly 1,000 American defenders. Within three hours of the British opening fire, six British ships were raining down bullets and bombs upon Fort McHenry. At one point, a British bomb was exploding above or in the fort every 45 seconds. But after two days of fighting, the British Navy still was not able to destroy the fort, and so they retreated and Baltimore was saved. And the tide of the war now turned in the United States' favor. The defending of Fort McHenry would inspire, as I said, Francis Scott Key to write the words that would eventually become the Star Spangled Banner, also known as the National Anthem. The legacy of Fort McHenry lives on in that song, and some of its former soldiers may live on now in a sense as spirits still haunting the grounds. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Fort McHenry. Paul Plamen, a veteran ranger at the park, says something starts to change when the sun goes down. He calls the reports he gets from other rangers about mysterious or unexplainable events happenings. And according to him, there have been many happenings over the years. For instance, many rangers and guests have reported seeing the ghost of Levi Claget, an unfortunate American lieutenant who died defending Fort McHenry during the War of 1812, and Private John Drew, who took his own life at the fort decades later in 1880 after being arrested for falling asleep on guard duty. On September 13, 1814, artillery officer Claget was manning a gun on Bastion 3, one of the five points that jut out from the star-shaped fort, when he and a sergeant named John Clem were killed instantly when one of around 1,500 bombs launched by British warships made a direct hit. And now in recent years, visitors to the park have reported seeing a man dressed exactly like Claget on Bastion 3. And these reports have consistently described a military man in a uniform only used briefly by the U.S. Navy at the time he died. These visitors are left dumbfounded when they find out that there were no reenactors in costume on the grounds that day. It's interesting that people have reported this phantom soldier is not walking on the ground, but slightly above it. During the Battle of Baltimore, the water batteries were not in the location they are today, leading many to think that Claget is stuck walking on the ground that existed when he died in 1814. Visitors have also reported seeing the ghost of Private John Drew. On the evening of Sunday, November 14, 1880, Private Drew was assigned guard duty on the outer battery, and around midnight, Private Drew was found asleep at his post. He was immediately placed under arrest and confined to the guardhouse to await trial by court-martial. The sergeant of the guard left his Springfield rifle next to the cell door, stepped away for a moment. Within seconds, he heard the sound of a gunshot. Rushed back to the cell, he found Private Drew lying dead on the floor from a single gunshot wound to the head. In the years since this terrible incident, at least a dozen visitors to the fort have reported seeing a man in a soldier's cape pacing endlessly back and forth along the same outer battery where Drew was derelict in his duties nearly 120 years ago. Once, Warren Bielenberg, the director of visitor services at the fort, couldn't stand not being able to see what so many others were claiming to see and blurted out, John, if that's you, send us a message. He'd later say, I'll swear on this until the day I die that there came a tap like a fingernail at the window of the guardhouse. It came from 15 feet in front of me and I couldn't see anything making the noise. Darn right there are ghosts at Fort McHenry. A weirder example of invisible spirits roaming the peninsula, known as Whetstone Point, involve a psychic and a Hasidic Jew. In the late 1970s, Warren Bielenberg, again the same director of visitor services, was befriended by a local psychic named Dorothy Bathgate. Dorothy would wander the grounds with staffers after hours and pick out spots where bodies had been piled up in the old days, places where mortuaries once stood. This seemed impressive, but these spots could have easily been picked out with a little bit of research, so not everyone was convinced that Dorothy was a real psychic. 
But then once upon a uh, up on Claggett's bastion, Bathgate described a scene of a wounded of wounded bodies, including one man with a beard. The staffers she was with immediately scoffed. They all knew that in the War of 1812, beards on soldiers were not permitted. A few years later, though, Fort Stafford came upon an obituary of a Jewish merchant who served at Fort McHenry during the British bombardment. The merchant was a Hasidic Jew who did not have enough money to buy his way out of service, and because of religious freedom, would not have been forced to cut his beard. The obituary said the man was wounded on Clag Claggett's Bastion during the Battle of Baltimore. About 70 to 80 percent of the things she said were substantiated later on, Warren Bielenberg said to reporters later. I had a hard time believing some of it, but I have no other way of explaining it. Other less recognizable spirits have sometimes appeared. Once a woman came up to the park rangers and said she saw feet hanging off the ground. When park rangers investigated, they saw that the place she was pointing to used to be the hangman's gallows. In another instance, a tour guide was moving through a regular park tour when a woman came up to him and said, Back in those days, did the defenders have two white cross bells and wear blue coats and white pants and boots? He said, yes. Well, she said, there were two of them behind you, hovering. As always, the tour guide checked to see if there were reenactors present at the park that day. There were not. And there are still other spirits reportedly witnessed by visitors. Spirits that are not believed to belong to former soldiers from the early 19th century. Fort McHenry's ghosts are not just from the War of 1812. In August of 1917, the U.S. Army converted Fort McHenry into General Hospital No. 2 for soldiers who had been injured in World War I. The hospital specialized in facial reconstruction and rehabilitation. By 1919, Fort McHenry went from having approximately 30 buildings to over 100, and at its height was treating over 3,500 patients. For a brief time, it was the largest military hospital in the nation. Undoubtedly, the men who were housed at General Hospital II suffered some horrendous trauma, both physically and mentally, while many of those wounded ultimately recovered and returned home to their families. Many also succumbed to their injuries and died. The Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 also took a toll on those recovering at Fort McHenry and may have added to the many ghosts wandering the complex. Many of the accounts of ghost activity at Fort McHenry were originally reported by park rangers assigned to the site, and that remained the case up until a couple decades ago. Today, however, in what some say is an effort to keep the site from being regarded as a haunted fort and to instead emphasize the non-supernatural important history of the National Monument and Historic Shrine, the managers of Fort McHenry declined to directly comment on phenomena that are still regularly reported on by visitors. Potential ghost hunters should also expect to have anything they ask to do with the site be curtailed by red tape. A favorite tactic at Fort McHenry is to require application of a special use permit for anything its managers don't really want people to do. One has to wonder, could the deliberate silence about the park's ghosts indicate that the spirits are more restless than ever? Do they not want to speak about them because the park rangers are afraid of giving these spirits even more of a hold on Fort McHenry? Or as some think, do they keep people from investigating with special use permits because they know someone might find something truly terrifying, something that might follow them home? One visitor posted a comment about such an experience saying, I entered the holding cell and bolted out. I told my cousin something evil was in there and I wanted to leave now. The next morning when I awoke in my bed at my hotel, a young boy was looking straight in my face. He had black hair and brown eyes. I was paralyzed. Before I could move, he laughed and rolled away, disappearing under the covers. I could not eat and drove back to Pennsylvania where I was sick for a week. Whatever is, is at Fort McHenry, it can stay there. Sorry, the whole time that you were talking, mm -hmm. these spider webs were moving. Oh, my shoulder was uh, hitting them. Okay. It didn't look like it from this angle. And I was like, what is happening over there? But that would make sense for like one of them. But like why the ones behind you on the bookshelves are shaking. <laughs> Who knows? Not comfortable in here right now. <laughs> Do you want to see a few pictures? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I was just staring over there like, <laughs> I don't like this. Here's a recent picture of Fort McHenry, that star-shaped fort. It's pretty That's cool. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like the Coeur d'Alene Golf Resort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Just the, the land around it. <laughs> yeah, so green and lush. Uh, next picture, old sketch of Fort McHenry during the War of 1812. All those ships out in the harbor raining down bombs upon him. Yeah. And then, uh, just be silly, I wanted to see what would show up if I did an image search for a guy named Henry in a fort. <laughs> And this is Henry Lynn. This photo was taken for a 2021 article on fortworthbusiness.com. Congrats to Henry here for being named a candidate in the 2021 U.S. Presidential Scholars Program. <laughs> One of the highest honors bestowed upon graduating high school seniors. Only Fort Worth student uh, select for candidacy. All right. Well, good job, good sir. Good job, Henry Lynn. Pride <laughs> of Texas right there. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, those old battlegrounds. Like we've we've had. I, I know I had a fan story on my side a long time ago about reenactments and like some buddies. Maybe they went. Oh man, it was like they would go. And for these reenactments, you would like spend the night out there yeah. as well. Like you would, you would be in the reenactment area for a long time. Yeah. And he thought he saw something, and mm. like, or oh, it was like, um, they were like around a campfire. They were going to spend the night there, and then he, the one guy got up like in the middle of the night to I don't know relieve himself or something, and he saw something out in the woods, and definitely thought it was just another reenactment yeah. actor. But then I forget exactly what happened that allowed him to know like, nope, that was not what I thought it was. Hmm. That would be such a oh god, man, those those old forts would be such a great place for a haunted house mm -hmm. because it seems probable that something very real would show itself. Mm, so many, so many traumatic events ha happened in those places, you know, where people yeah. lost their lives, you know, young and tragically mm -hmm. lost limbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of pain, a lot of pain. Woo -wee. A lot of fear too. Of yeah. just, you know, like the, the, the fear people are feeling while they're, you know, waiting to be attacked while they're being attacked. I am you know, not just cut the out stress for that. And, trauma of that yeah yeah like speaking of veterans day and you know this month like no way oh, i mean yeah. i had to do it if it was life or death okay but i don't know like not to go completely off topic but i you know listen to the news every morning i was like right there's still a war going on in the ukraine mm -hmm. so much respect for combat ve veterans and uh you know just uh feel so terrible for people in war zones that way i mean to experience that firsthand yeah to having, you know, hearing bombs dropping around you, bullets, you know, whizzing by, bullets coming for you. It is quite literally unimaginable for the average American citizen. Yeah, yeah if, You have a, nothing to compare it to. Truly a fight for life and death. Yeah. And, and especially when it's in your neighborhood, oh waking God. up each day not knowing if that's going to be, like, like knowing that there's, there's a decent chance it's going to be your last. I know, it's so crazy. Like in the Ukraine right now, like they've lost a lot of power in some places because yeah. of the drone strikes. And it just is, I don't know. And then I was... Oh, it's just so overwhelming on so many levels. But I was listening to something on the news about how, like, I, I don't know if I'm going to get this 100% correct, mm -hmm. but you'll get the overall idea. There are Ukrainian citizens, maybe they're in England, and they're being trained in England so that they can go back Man. to the Ukraine and help to fight. But they were saying, the, regardless of, like, where exactly they are, they were, what what the report was saying is that it would take a minimum of yeah. 10 weeks to properly train these people. And they're getting like five days of training and then off you go. Good luck. Man. It's like, fuck. That's such a wild thing. Like, and again, all over Putin's un ego. Unfathomable yeah. to me because yeah. I have always lived a life of safety. Isn't that crazy? All that death, the result of one guy's ego. Oh my God. One guy entering a sovereign nation unnecessarily. That is not needed for their economy. It is not needed on any level other than just his but pride. But I want it. Yep. Yep. Oh just God. like a freaking toddler, giant spoiled brat. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Eat you, All right. Well, would you are you are you ready for my spooks? I am. Okay. Do you have ooh? Do you have a Layla over there? Did oh, I forget to Layla oh no. you? I forgot to grab one. You, here. Here's the thing. I'll go grab one. No. Here's the thing. You can have a giant Layla. Ooh. I'll do that. Careful. Nice. Gentle. Nice. Be gentle. I know. A handcrafted one. I know. It's okay. so cute. There you go. Oh, big Layla. It's like, it's <laughs> that's like, awesome. That's like, like fan Layla. made. So cool. I know we got that at summer camp. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like Layla daddy. And this is like Layla mommy. <laughs> yeah. Those are the parent Laylas. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. I oh, love it so much. All right. So funeral homes. How, how much time have you spent in funeral homes? Have you ever actually, let me backpedal. Having now gone to hmm. your grandfather's funeral. Yeah. And like just understanding rural mm -hmm. accessibility to things like that. Have you ever been in a proper funeral home? Literally never stepped inside of a funeral home ever. I, I was thinking that that would be the case. Yeah. So like my childhood, very, very different. But unfortunately, my family just had this long stretch of... <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not funny, but it just it was actually kind of comical. A comical. I was missing so much school because we were constantly at funerals. It was yeah. insane. My brother and I did the math and it was something like 30 family members in a five-year span. It's like the craziest fucking thing. Our family just went whoop. It was, yeah. and, and just all some, you know, elderly, some tragic stuff, yeah. whatever. But like, I could tell you the layout of the funeral home that we used every right. single time. I could tell you how it smelled. Like I, the memories are so deep in my brain. Yeah. And it's so fascinating to me that like, you've never even been in a funeral home. No, 
That there, there isn't one in Riggins, like where I grew no. up. And so, you know, you'd have... Um, Could you go to Grangeville for one? Yeah, that's, Grangeville, like for... Well, like my grandpa Ward, like his coffin and stuff came from Grangeville. But like, it's also not tradition where I'm from, from for anybody to do like open casket or they, they just, they don't wow. hold services in those, in those ways. Okay. They just have it locally in a church. Like or like a or well, like a community kind of event center, like yeah. the Od- Odd Fellows Lodge or something. Mm-hmm. Not in a funeral home. So mm, yeah. unless you are the one, like it's your spouse or something that would then go to Grangeville to make the arrangements at the funeral home there, you just don't go. Like if you're just somebody, if you're just somebody attending the funeral, mm-hmm. you don't go to the funeral home. So just so that I'm understanding this correctly, the only reason one would go to a funeral home in the area that you're from is mm-hmm. to procure a casket and mm-hmm. pick out the casket. Okay, so where I'm from, there are casket stores. You don't even do that at the funeral home. Mm. It, you can, but oftentimes you just go to a casket store. I don't, I don't actually know what it would be called. Casco? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> but, uh, but you would you would go. I'm and- picturing the snacks that they would hand out at Casco. <laughs> as you're walking, walking down aisle after aisle of so many caskets, and then there's just like a random lady <laughs> with a hairnet <laughs> asking you if you want to try this like new salami. <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, but, like, so for my family, you know, what would happen is once that was kind of chosen, you know, you would go to the funeral home to make the arrangements, meaning mm. what were the hours of visitation going to be always open casket? Even, like, my my cousin and my uncle were killed in really horrific accidents. And my poor aunt, like, her husband yeah, and her yeah. son separately. But, like, still open casket, like, rebuilt their faces. So awkward. Mm. Um, open casket, and then you'd have viewing hours. So viewing hours were like the casket. You're you would walk into this funeral home, and it's always like this old, creepy house kind of thing. It smells a little funny, like disinfectant, and mm-hmm. I don't know what else, like candles and incense burning. And then there's usually like a long hallway. At least this was my experience with four to six viewing rooms. So like, you know, the Smiths might be having a viewing over here, mm-hmm. and the Cumminses might be having a viewing over here. So there were multiple funeral viewings happening. So there's like lots yeah. of dead bodies lying around yeah. and people and then viewings would be like, you know, you'd have, you know, this day from 11 to 2 and 4 to 6 and then the next day another set of viewings and then the next day was the funeral. Mm-hmm. And it was it was Man. fascinating to me. It's a big process. Oh, yeah. Well, and then like Catholic, a Catholic funeral mass. So this mm-hmm. is like what I'm I'm bringing all this up to say it how we're approaching, how we're coming into the story, like it's so different, our experiences with funeral homes yeah. and what that would actually mean. So I just wanted to give you that kind of layout because it's probably different than what you would oh, yeah. think of when it comes to a funeral. Yeah, my experience is like movies and TV shows, just seeing it. Oh. I uh, I just got to get something out of my head. Yeah. This is not uh, horror this, related at all. This, this is about is, Casco? This is absurd. No, yeah. it's not even about Casco. <laughs> this is about um, for what I would like ideally for my funeral. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. I want to, it's going to be expensive. Okay. But I want an animatronic suit. I want an <laughs> animatronic exoskeleton. So, so that my my dead body can actually fully move around in like a lifelike way. Oh and then my for god, the, that's and, terrible! And then for the viewing, like as the viewing begins, I want like music to kick on mm-hmm. and kind of like a disco ball and situation. And then I pop up out of the casket and like do a jig, like do a little dance, so people can dance with me. If they want. How's that dance going to go? Because you can't even dance now. Just how like I can make it better in death. I can have a cool program dance. <laughs> And then I want like maybe moonwalk and stuff. Oh. And then uh, I want an adults only. So then I, I do that for like the the first couple hours. Okay. And then people, and then I want an adults only mm-hmm. dance at it, like viewing. And then that would intrigue do people. Naked? Chippendales. It's gonna be <laughs> Chippendales. I want an animatronic <laughs> Chippendales show. Mm-hmm. I like that. Okay. I'm going to share my vision of funeral that I recently just told one of my best friends, Randy. I don't know why we were talking about funerals, Mm -hmm. but I was like, Randy, if I die tomorrow, here's what I want to happen. I want you to rent out the Coeur d'Alene Resort Spa. I want you to gather all my favorite people and make sure everyone has a great time. They relax. They recuperate. They take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And then I want want you to rent out a restaurant. I want there to be a really nice dinner. I want everyone to have all their favorite things. I want you to share your favorite memories. And she's crying. She's like, of course, that's what you'd want. You'd want everyone to be taken care of. I like that you want everyone to laugh mm-hmm. and be absurd and mm-hmm. silly and celebrate that. Oh, yeah. That's who you are. Mm-hmm. And this is who I am. I do think funerals should be a better reflection oh, yeah. of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. We can discuss o- alternate options as well, like a Viking funeral. That sounds great. <laughs> right. <laughs> Somebody shoot a flaming arrow out into a pyre floating out in the water. How dope would that be? It's pretty, pretty, yeah, dramatic. It's if, exciting. If you were, if we were out on the lake next summer mm-hmm. and we saw that going down, we would be like, that's amazing. True. And I'd have people wonder if I was like a, a Viking warrior or something. You might have been. I know this is, I don't want to keep, stay away from the war for too long. Okay. But during your 
funeral vision, mm -hmm. uh, my mind went to once all your friends were relaxing and getting their massages, uh -huh. you're in the animatronic <laughs> exoskeleton. <laughs> <laughs> you, giving head massages? You're the masseuse. Oh my God. Like just your clammy hands, <laughs> just rubbing, <laughs> rubbing their backs. <laughs> and then like, then they notice and it's like, <sighs> what a weird emotional space to be in where they're like, if they're like, oh my God, like then it's kind of offensive, right? It's like, sure. mm -hmm. God, we are so weird. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about this funeral home. Okay. Hello, king and queen of the suck, longtime listener and so pumped about Scared to Death. I have introduced you to my lovely wife and she cannot get enough. Thank you so much for always being such a great time for me and her. Sorry for the length of this, but a lot happened. Just a little backstory, I'm a funeral director and I work in a sleepy little town in Iowa. I talked my way into a job in high school, washing cars and mowing lawns. After college, I was licensed and was now working more with the actual dead. I have always had a sense of uneasiness while working in the funeral home, even if it was the middle of the day. Eyes staring daggers in my back kind of feelings. Hushed whispers that would not be found. I know it's a house of the dead, but something was off. This building was not just being... This building was not old, just being 14 years after it had been built. I know what you're thinking, of course. Every funeral home is scary. Yeah, they are. That The setup for the funeral home was very easy to work with. Employees would enter through the garage where most of the work was done. Dressing bodies, cosmetics, casketing, because our embalming suit was just too small. I was told stories from the owner of the funeral home that his father-in-law, now deceased, liked to pay him visits every now and again. Me, being a young punk and a skeptic, thought he was trying to scare me. I brushed off the comment and continued my work. I went through the work week and nothing happened. I had completely forgot about what he had said about his father-in-law. The next week, I was getting a body ready for the visitation to be held that night and I was rushed. I was working alone in the garage when a whiff of tobacco entered my nose. Not uncommon, the smoking station was just outside the door and we had some employees that smoked. As I was getting ready to place the gentleman in his casket, I saw a man next to me in a suit. Thinking it was one of my co-workers, I tried to hand them the hat that was to be displayed in the casket. The hat hit the floor, and when I turned to look why they didn't grab it, I was met by a man in a dark suit with black shoes, a completely black face, and what looked like a pipe where a mouth should have been. I stood there in shock. I could not speak. My neck felt tight, and the air in my lungs burned. I looked away, only to look back and see this man had simply vanished. We had a video camera in the garage to see who comes and goes, and they were always on. So I walked to the office where the recordings were kept and asked to see the tape. Not sure of what I not sure of what just had happened. We watched the tape, and you can clearly see me working. Then the frame goes black as if something passed by the lens, but only for a second. The next frame, I'm standing there alone next to the casket, and the hat is suddenly on the ground. No video evidence. This was not the first time I encountered this gentleman. Later that month, I was embalming late one night by myself as I like to do when I heard my name being whispered softly, but very sternly. I stopped embalming to see if another employee had walked into the garage next to the prep room. No one was there. It was snowing and I opened the door to see if any footprints were fresh, but to my surprise, nothing. I played it off as I, I was tired and just wanted to finish up so I could go home and get some sleep. I started embalming again when I heard my name for a second time, this time louder and with something much darker in the inflection. I opened the door again, armed with a scalpel. I walked through the <laughs> funeral home only to find nothing. I checked the snow and still no footprints. I laughed off what had happened and just wanted to be done for the night. Hair standing up on my neck, I tried to finish my job. I turned on some music to break the silence, but not more than five minutes later, I heard three distinct knocks on the door that I now had locked. I opened the door shaking. Hello? I asked. Nothing. I should have left, but I made the claim out loud that you do not scare me, so give me your best shot. <laughs> we had a shelf above where I was standing that held random items, and as I said, you don't scare me, an unused container of sharps flew off the shelf uh. and hit me in the head, breaking as it hit the ground. The smell of tobacco filled the room, and I knew exactly who was there with me. As I looked up from the broken container, there he was. Dark suit, all black face, pipe coming out of what should have been a mouth, blocking me from the only door out. I panicked. I screamed, what do you want? 
He stood there silent. I, almost in tears from fear, asked again what he wanted, and as quickly as he appeared, he vanished through the locked door. Shaking from fear, I stood in the prep room, hoping I could muster up the strength to move my legs that now felt too heavy to move. I have no idea how long I was stuck standing in that position. I finally mustered the courage to stop the embalming and make my way through the garage and out to the parking lot to head home. I left in a hurry. When I had gotten home, I told my wife what had happened and she lost it. She said we needed to burn a white candle to clean the air to make sure he hadn't followed me home. Taking her advice, we did just that. When I told the owner of the funeral home what had happened the next day, he told me he had a dream of his father-in-law just that night. Chills ran down my spine. The owner asked me if I had gotten what I wanted. I was confused and asked what he meant by that. He replied, well, you asked him for his best shot, didn't you? I had told, <laughs> I had not told him what I had said to the ghost, but in his dream, he had heard my demands. This is just one of the many stories I have from working in the funeral home late at night. Thank you so much for all of the fun. All the best, Lance. Man, Lance. Well, you're scribbling over there. What do you got? Just making notes about that uh, story. Well, one, one of the notes I didn't want to forget is um, the, it was reminding me at first, I'm like, of one of the TLA when we were doing that, the movies, mm -hmm. uh, the autopsy of Jane Doe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I just thought that was such a great place to set a horror movie. I was surprised I hadn't seen one set there before. Uh-huh. Yeah, it and is such a smart choice. Yeah, and so in my mind, again, you know, probably more limited with actually having not having been in those places in real life. Yeah. As he, as you're telling Lance's story, I'm picturing the setting of that movie mm -hmm, of like mm -hmm. just how spooky that would be. And like after that. The encounter where, you know, like he hears the, uh, bet, you know, give me your best shot or take your best shot, yeah. makes that claim and like the three knocks and sees the the dude in the hat for the second time. Mm -hmm. I was thinking how hard it would be to go back to work alone in that setting after that night. I, I wouldn't He didn't say he quit or anything. It's no, like, he still works there. Right. Or as a funeral director. Man, I would be so rattled after that, just not knowing when something like that. I mean, I guess he didn't get hurt, but still that is so creepy. And the dream connection. Yeah, I know. That's a great detail. I thought so too. Yeah. I, 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 not only the dream, but the like, well, did you get what you want? <laughs> right. <laughs> give, give me your what best shot. What a creepy shot. funeral home director too. <laughs> I kind of love it though. Yeah. Yeah. It, this whole story had me realizing that in all the funerals that I'd been to at the Bush family funeral home in Parma, Ohio, mm -hmm. where we had all of our family funerals. So you would after, okay. After the church, uh, funeral and after going to the cemetery, yeah. then everybody would come back to the funeral home and you'd have a reception in the basement of the funeral home. Like you'd have lunch, you'd mm. have a luncheon. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'm thinking about that and I thought, A, super weird, super weird. You're eating downstairs when like a bunch of dead bodies are above you. And B, mm. I never figured out where the embalming rooms were. Like I was a little kid oftentimes running around oh, these yeah. places. And I thought like, oh my God, wait, were they like embalming bodies? Like right where I'm eating, <laughs> where they obviously not, know, but like, I, I, where picture. is that happening? I picture like the embalming room and the snack preparation room being the same room. Casco. <laughs> they just have a big refrigerator, fr fridge freezer combo, just in between two gurneys. They where just like the bodies are on. The bodies are like always in those like drawers, and they're like, "Hey, do you want some ice cream?" Then they just oh, exactly. pull open. Like, oopsies, this is Bob. Let's close it. Here we go. Here's <laughs> here's the <laughs> ice cream bars. <laughs> Or they like if there's an emergency and their freezer kind of goes kaput, rather than letting things spoil, they just <laughs> set it on one of the one of their clients. Just put the ice cream and stuff. Just... Oh my god, <laughs> that would be okay if you were hosting a Halloween party and yeah. you wanted it to be really spooky but also really lighthearted. Mm -hmm. If you could rent out an old morgue and you could put mannequins. Oh yeah. In the the shoe, I don't like the drawers, you know, and have them all kind of like open and staggered, yeah. and then you know have like charcuterie boards on their bellies, but then pay people, yeah. actors, to lie in some of those spots yeah, instead of mannequins. That's what I was thinking. It's so fun. Like when the kid when the kid goes to grab the snack, <laughs> just grab their arm. Ah! Just oh my god, the, it, it is so much fun to scare little kids because <sighs> they have such big reactions. But then they cry. Yeah, it's not, yeah, there's so a, there's the danger fun. that you take it too far. <laughs> I, I was thinking of an adult Halloween party. Oh, I was thinking of kids losing their of course shit. You are. Of course you are. Are we going to try and scare kids this Halloween? We talked about like... I know. I talked to somebody else who, who did what I was uh, thinking about doing, where you sat on, on the porch and pretend to be a dummy. Uh-huh. And then just like scared the kids. And mm -hmm. she was saying like her husband did that and, uh, you know... Got sued. Nope. Nope. Nobody <laughs> got sued. Nobody freaked out too bad. But I'm afraid that I would just yell too deep. I don't know. I don't know. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I would scare somebody too much. I feel like you could put like a a sign at your door or like something. So we have a gate. Maybe mm -hmm. it could be like, 
enter your own risk actors at play, like some mm. sort of. But then you're tipping them off and it ruins it. Well, not not if you have like a bunch of different things in the yard mm. and then you're mixed in with it. And then rah. <laughs> there was always a few spooky houses in our neighborhood growing up. And yeah. there was one where it was like you you had to run to the door because like you didn't know they would like have something jump out of their garage and like above their garage, it has the floodlight. Mm-hmm. But you had to go down the driveway and then sort of over this way to get to the front door. Yeah. But they had full candy bars. So Ooh. you had to risk it. Do you think parents would be upset if I actually like had a real taser and tased kids? Nah. Like you get away with that. Like totally. uh, under the guise of Halloween. Oh, like, just like, under like, the guise of like I heard your kids a little shit. Right. I was thinking, I'm, like, I'm doing some parenting work for you. I was thinking of tase like in costume, I tase them and then just scream something, now you die. No, and it, then but then like, ah, gotcha. Or or you could just be like dressed up like a cop, and be like, ah, it's just part of my, oh my costume. <laughs> in character. <laughs> like, oh, sorry. Freeze. <laughs> Where do you get the candy? <laughs> Immediately tase them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, okay. So now we have the story of the lady in the chair. Yeah. And this story is so, so freaking creepy to me. Uh, so this family. Creepy title. It is. Uh, this family is moving and like in typical kid fashions, like mm-hmm. the kids are freaking useless. Yeah. Like they're just, you know, it's like, <laughs> go away from me. And I was thinking as I was you know, preparing the story for the show. I'm like, yeah, of course parents don't want to be bothered by like you're screaming and you're crying. We're busy moving. Shut up, go away. <laughs> right? Yeah. Thankfully, uh, our, our fan who sent this in, she goes by Juju Moon. She had a grandmother who was able to help her deal with this situation. Okay. It's like, yeah, of course grandma's going to help you. Uh-huh. Mom and dad are too busy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lindsay. Hey, Dan. I've Hello. Listened, I've listened to the Scared to Death podcast on and off now for over two years. I love both of your storytelling abilities, so I decided to send in my own scary tale. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoy this tale about an experience that still haunts me. The best way to frame this story is to tell you a little bit about my childhood. My parents divorced when I was about three, so most of my younger years were spent being passed back and forth between my mom and my dad. The most constant presence in my life was my grandmother on my dad's side. She would babysit me every day until I was about 12. She was, and still is, one of the most beautiful and fiercely Mm -hmm. powerful women I have ever met. She's also very connected to the spirit realm, a medium, in fact. Most women in her family, on her family side, are psychics, mediums, or highly sensitive. I am not an exception. Growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I knew from a young age that I was highly sensitive. Even as a child, I would have these knowing moments, as Graham called them. These knowing moments are best described as me knowing things I could not possibly know. For example, I would always know when someone would come to visit or call before they did so. I would even know who it was and when they would show up. I would tell my mom every time I was right, and she would give me this look like, how the fuck could you know that? The story is not about those knowing moments, but rather about my other gift, my darker gift my ability to see spirits. This is the story about the first time I had ever seen a ghost and the first time scared me so much that I blocked it out and I blocked out this gift until my adulthood. When I was about six, I spent the weekend with my dad and his side of the family. This weekend happened to be when my aunt moved into her new house in a suburb right outside of the city. As the dutiful older brother and only son, my dad was drafted to help with the move. Of course, the move occurred on his weekend with me. My mom was a stickler about sticking to the agreed-to custody agreement, so there was no way he could switch this weekend, weekend, meaning I had to tag along and help move Aunt T. Now, keep in mind, I was about six and small for my age, so I was not helping anyone with anything. (laughs) My form of helping was staying out of the way. Lucky for me, Aunt T's son, my cousin, Martin, always wanted to play. My cousin and I were very close as children. We were born only months apart, we were only children, and my gram babysat us both well into our childhoods. We were more like siblings than cousins. When my dad and I arrived at my aunt's new house, I remember having a very weird, uneasy feeling in my stomach. A feeling I now know is a warning that something bad is about to happen. Of course, six-year-old me had no clue. I walked through the house's front door, and Martin came running down the steps to get me. As soon as Martin and I locked in a hug, my dad told us both to run along and try to stay out of the way. The adults would be busy moving heavy stuff, and he didn't want any problems. Martin and I knew better than to test my dad's temper, so we swiftly ran away to Martin's new room. 
As soon as we approached his new room, I had a feeling I was not welcome there. I did not want to cross the threshold completely. Something inside of me told me to run away, but Martin did not seem to have this feeling. I stood at the threshold to his room, looking around, taking in the empty room, aside from an old white rocking chair in the corner. There was no other furniture in that room except that chair. Martin was busying himself with his Hot Wheel cars and putting together the track so we could race. After a few minutes, I forced myself to go into his room and sit down on the floor beside Martin to help him put the track together. We sat there and played for a while. We sat there and played for what felt like a long time without any issues. That unwelcome feeling I had when I first walked in had subsided and I felt comfortable. As we played, I would randomly hear creaking and would turn around to look back at that rocking chair in the corner, but then nothing, no sound. I would turn back to my pink Hot Wheel and push it down the track but then I would hear it again. Creak, creak, creak. The distinct sound of an old chair being rocked on hardwood floors. Creak, creak, creak. I looked over at Martin to see if he had heard the sound or if it even phased him. Nothing. It was just me who could hear the creaking. All of a sudden, I felt a cold chill run down my back, goosebumps forming on my arms and legs. And then I felt her. I felt her before I even saw her, eyes boring into the back of my head. Then creak, creak, creak. I forced myself to turn around to look at that old chair in the corner, but I was not prepared for what I would see when I looked. The moment I saw her, I felt this sense of utter dread and sadness. She was thin, gaunt, really. She looked like she hadn't eaten in years. Her skin, a transparent white color, like she was there, but also not really there. Her hair was black, black as chimney soot, and she sat atop and it sat there atop her head in this knot-like bun. She was wearing a black Victorian-style dress that fell all the way to her feet, except she didn't have any feet. When I finally looked into her eyes, they were a milky white color. She looked like she was blind, but I knew she wasn't. Just as I saw her, she saw me. She stopped rocking in the chair and smiled at me. But this smile wasn't kind or warm. It was cold and almost too wide for her thin face. Her lips curled in an inhuman fashion. I sat there frozen, staring at her as her milky white eyes took me all in. She slowly lifted her hand and began patting her lap, beckoning me to come sit with her. And then I heard this voice in my head like a whisper in the wind. Come to me, little child, come to me. I was frozen in absolute fear because I knew this woman was not alive. She did not belong in this realm. I knew at that moment if I went to her, something bad would happen. When I stayed in my spot on the floor, her smile disappeared and was replaced with anger, maybe hatred. She slowly started to get out of the chair, glaring at me with malice. As she began to move towards me, arms outstretched to grab me, Martin looked up and over to follow my gaze. He screamed, knocked me out of my frozen fear state, and I screamed too. As loud as we could, we screamed for my dad. Not that I could, now that I could move, the only thought in my six year old brain was to grab Martin and run. I grabbed him by the hand, us both still screaming, and we ran. We ran down the hallway and right into my dad. Now, at this point, my dad was soaked in sweat and was not in the mood to deal with two screaming children. Martin and I grabbed onto my dad for dear life and tried our best to vocalize what we had just seen. My dad, annoyed and tired, was not having any of it. He grabbed us by our arms, kicked us both outside, and told us to play or he would give us something to scream about. Problematic, I know. I had no interest in hearing, he had no interest in hearing a word about a ghost woman in Martin's bedroom. Both Martin and I refused to go back into that room for the rest of the day. Once it was finally time to leave, my dad, exhausted from a long day of heavy lifting, he simply grabbed my hand and led me to his car. He didn't say anything about the events of that day. The only words he had were to tell me that we were going to Wendy's to get some chicky nugs. <laughs> As we were walking down from the front drive toward my dad's old Jeep Wrangler, I felt that same cold chill run down my spine and I knew someone was watching me. No, I knew she was watching me. I couldn't help myself and I looked back at my aunt's new house and I saw her. She was standing in Martin's bedroom window, waving at me. That same Mm. creepy-ass smile on her face. It was as if she was saying goodbye, but come back soon. I turned around and told myself repeatedly, she's not real, she's not real. But I knew deep inside, she was very, very real. I never told my dad completely what I saw in my aunt's house that day. I knew he wouldn't believe me, or he'd tell me I'd been watching too much Scooby-Doo. 
So I didn't tell my mom either. She would have believed me, but she would have been terrified. I figured I'd spare her the additional stress. Even at six, I knew my parents' reactions to my gifts well. The only person I felt safe telling was Graham, and I'm glad I did. The look on her face was a mix of anger, horror, compassion, and knowing. She softly explained to me that some people, when they die, can't leave our plane. For some reason or another, they're simply stuck here. Some of those spirits are harmless and merely lost, while some of those spirits can help you move on, while some spirits you can help move on. Other spirits mean living people harm. Those spirits you banish no matter what. She put some Florida water, a hoodoo version of holy water used for cleansing in African traditional religions, on my forehead and hands to cleanse me of my bad juju and wrapped me in one of her long spin me around hugs. (laughs) To this day, I don't know what Graham did to that spirit, but I know she did not waste any time going to my Aunt T's brand new home to deal with the spirit who dared to mess with her beloved grandchildren. The next time I visited the house, the chair was gone and the house felt Mm. light and welcoming. The woman with the white eyes was no longer there. Here I am, 25 years old, and I have still, and I still see spirits, but I've never experienced that frozen fear ever again. Nor have I ever seen the woman with the white eyes again. Now, whenever I encounter a spirit, I remember Graham's words of wisdom. I always keep a bottle of Florida water in the house just in case I need it and take a page out of her playbook to tell that spirit to get the fuck out (laughs) (laughs) or just to find out how scary the living can be. I hope you both enjoyed my story. You're both amazing. Keep on being scared to death. Best wishes, Juju Moon. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Juju Moon. Uh, what was that thing? Florida water? Yeah, Florida. I'd never heard of it either. Okay, so the hoodoo version of holy water used for cleansing in African traditional religions. Huh, okay. Yeah, not just not familiar with that. No, me me either. Florida water. Florida, how's it spelled? Like the state, Florida. Oh, Flor- Florida? Oh, okay. I couldn't tell if it was Florida, like the Florida Lee. Oh, like the, the New Orleans Florida thing. Lee water? Yeah. yeah. But fl- oh, okay, okay. Yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, or fluoride? Did you think I was saying fluoride? No, no, yeah, <laughs> that's I for I was your like, teeth. <laughs> uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, Grandma came through at the end there because the notes I were making where I was like, "Poor Martin." I, I was picturing I him getting left there, which is having to deal with this thing that nobody believes. I know. I, I mean, know. she got to go home, right? Uh, Bye. Right, but then Martin, after this horrible experience, and interesting that he didn't notice it at first, uh-huh. and then it appeared at the end. But if you see that and like your <laughs> and, and how unfortunate, like you've just moved into this house. Yeah. Here's here's your new room, uh-huh. and then right out the gate. There's some monstrous woman that you see in the corner. <sighs> and, and now it's like, all right, go to bed, Martin. Yeah. Nighty Good night. <laughs> Sleep tight. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully grandma got there that same night. I know she got yeah. there quickly, mm-hmm. but hopefully Martin didn't uh, have to have to go to bed in that space. Yeah. It is really fascinating that prior to Juju Moon going there, Martin mm-hmm. clearly hadn't noticed anything, felt anything. I mm-hmm. mean, they had just moved in. So maybe he hadn't really spent that much time there yet. And he didn't notice it at first during the creaking. Like no, when she wasn't was, hearing it. Mm-mm. Yeah. But by the end. Mm hmm. Huh. And like such a typical dad response, like, don't make me give you something to scream about. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm sweaty. I'm tired. I don't have and time for your nonsense. Yeah. Your nonsense is just that nonsense. Mm-hmm. I'm doing real work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I also love the chicky nugs. I was like, mm-hmm. yep, we all say that to other chicky nuggets. <laughs> like, why do we talk to kids like that? Mm-hmm. But grandma's awesome. Grandma saved the day. Grandma saved the day. I bet that chair was burned, broken into pieces and burned. Mm-hmm. And really, in, that, in a situation like that, even if it was in the kid's imagination, not a bad road to go down at first. Like, if the kid mm-hmm. kept saying, like, well, now the dresser's, now I saw some of the dresser. And yeah. you, you can't just keep burning every piece of furniture you have. <laughs> right. But if, but if it's something that's not crucial and it's going to, like, you let you save the day, mm-hmm. I mean, even if it even if it was their imagination, getting rid of that one thing is probably a really good thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it's and certainly— Like, you're, you're, you know, you're siding with the kid. Well, I was just going to say, I think it certainly fosters a relationship of trust of a child feeling heard, mm-hmm. a feeling understood. Even Protected. If, even if you think it's complete and utter nonsense, even if you take that item and sell it on Craigslist, but in the meantime, you like convince them that you lit it on fire in the backyard, yeah. it's on bonfire, you took it to the dump, like just totally like you're saying, just validating kids' feelings is, I think, is just in general so important because then as they get older, mm-hmm. they will be able to come to you with other, bigger, more real things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if your kid says there's a ghost, I mean, listen, it's like you might have to get rid of like your husband. If your kid's like, daddy is a, daddy's a ghost, daddy's haunting me, but you do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. So the kids have been talking about how you're haunted. I'm haunted. Yes. Something attached to me. Yeah, you got to go. I have to go? Yeah. Oh, but make man. sure you leave the dogs. The dogs can stay? 
No, the dogs can stay with me. You can't have them. Oh, I can't have them for protection or anything? No, you're on your own. Oh, man, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Go get a job at Casco. <laughs> See if I can <laughs> digest some snacks there. Cask- is it Casco or Casket Co? I think Casco is just for, yeah. Like K-A-S-K, Casco? The, the K-E-T is silent. It's just Casco. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when I hear Logan's big belly laugh. It's spelled it's spelled casket code, but pronounced casco. Oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm, okay sure yeah and that is our show unless you have something else to add I do not I have Annabelle shout outs to add okay are you ready for that I am ready for some Annabelle shout outs all right well thank you to the following Annabelles for helping us make an awesome donation this month to a very cool veteran cause Lucifina Lisa <laughs> Kyle McHenry Leah Gray Lucas Leatherwood. Le- Lucas Leatherwood. I know what a fucking dope name. Mm-hmm. Tammy Nanke, Sam Beeman, James Clearly, Colin McGlinchey, Stephen Creighton, uh, Crichton, Mellow Method, Andrew Nicholson, Silk Moonrise, Cassie Wise, Paula Bloomquist, Derek Stoffel, Shannon Clark, Clive Buckingham, Donna Kelm, Josh Maxey, Kimmy Gray, Sarah Holt, Amber Kalaja, Brandon Smith, The Wentworth Family, and Allison Foster. Thank all of you. Uh, and thanks to the following Annabelles as well. John Dilliard, Chloe Dennison, Jeremy Cash, uh, Olivia Lovato, Randy Lewis, Jane Esplin, Ashlyn Adams, Jacob Shannon, A.J. Farmer, Gretchen Collier, uh, Adrian Roman, Christopher Penny, Annabelle Red, uh, Virginia, I have no idea. <laughs> Virginia o- Oni Sorge. Oni Sorge? Oni, Oni Sorge. I checked the spelling on that too. I'm not sure. O- Oni Sorge? I'm confident about Virginia. I don't have a clue about the last part. Virginia O. O H N E S O R G E. Own Oni Sorge. Uh, Logan Brownlee, Jason Allen, Jay Sandwith, uh, Michaela Ratliff, Brandy Lane, Chelsea Maloney. Stephanie Perryman, Khaleesi, Mother of Dragons. I added the Mother of Dragons part. Uh, wait, uh, what was it? Chelsea Maloney? Chelsea Maloney. Do you know I, Chelsea Maloney? I, I don't, but it sounds like Chelsea Maloney is the sidekick to DJ Honey. With me today, Chelsea Maloney, See, the like Baloney a- Lady. <laughs> ah, Baloney Lady doesn't have a right. But I, I'll come up with something. <laughs> I, just, I just, like, I can hear that inflection in that name, the way that it flows. Time for Hollywood Baloney with Chelsea Maloney. And then she just shares a bunch of gossip. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. We have the one minute. We have one minute of Hollywood baloney with Chelsea Maloney. Or, well, I can't even know what I'm saying now. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> Stephanie Perryman, uh, Kalicia, uh, Nell, mm, or Kel Enel, E H N L E, Kel Enel, uh, Nathan Perez, and Jenna Tanner. Some t- some tricky ones this yeah, week. Yeah, a couple tricky ones. A couple mm. tricky last names. Yeah, we're, I just want people to start making up last names. Just like just a, a lot of, of consonants. Yeah. A few vowels like really recklessly tossed in there. <laughs> and then with a note of like, hey, give this to Dan, see what he does. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. To Marcy from Andy. Happy one year anniversary. Can't wait to make even more memories with you. To Christy from James, happy belated birthday. And to Brad from Ashley. Thanks for being a great work husband and introducing <laughs> me to Scared to Death. Uh, that is a good work, husband. You're right. Uh, well, that's uh, that's all for today. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. We love them. Uh, you can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith, Tyler C. for the work on social media. Uh, Logan, again, for running badmagicmerch.com and for producing and directing today. Thanks to Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. And thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding today's first story and producer Sophie Evans for finding the second. If you want to watch the show in addition to listening, check out the cool uh, props that Logan's always switching up every week. The cool lighting scheme that Tyler has been tweaking. Mm -hmm. You can subscribe to Bad Magic Productions. Watch on YouTube. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scared to Death Podcast if you want to see the pics that accompany each episode. And we are also on TikTok now. If you want TikTok. some little teasers of the shows, you can pass around. If you don't want to hear ads, if you want to check out two dozen and counting monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these 
these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. If I see a naked succubus spirit, uh-huh. I have to fuck it. Yeah. 